and welcome to Relocation 101 Module 6. My name is Paula Hyman from the Ohio LTAP Center and I'm your technical support again today. Um, just the same housekeeping items, if you have questions throughout the presentation, please put them into the questions box. And um, in the handout section, there is one item available to download today. And if for some reason you're unable to download that, just put your email in the questions pod and I'll email it to you directly. So thank you in advance. I'm going to pass things off to Ms. Patty Mormon, Relocation Unit Manager with ODOT Central Office Real Estate. Patty. Well, good morning and welcome back to Relocation Assistance 101. We are now on Module 6. We're almost there, you know, one more module after this and you'll be you'll be ready then to get um, to get ready for the test for the whole one uh, relocation assistance 101. So today we're going to talk about planning for last resort housing and methods for providing last resort housing. And in your student um, handout manual, again, you do have my contact information. So you can, if you have questions, you can put them in the questions box, or if you have questions later on, uh, you can always contact me by either telephone or by email. So the purpose of this module is to look at the requirements for replacement housing of last resort. Now we have mentioned last resort housing several times in the other modules. Some of the situations we've talked about previously when we've been mentioning last resort housing were the need to consider last resort housing in the planning phases. Remember the conceptual and the pre-acquisition surveys um, when determining if the adequate housing is going to be available for the project. The need to consider last resort housing and the impact it may have in the project funding. RHPs in excess of 31,000, RSPs in excess of 72,000, and the RSP and the down payments for less than 90 day occupants are all addressed under last resort housing. So last resort housing is addressed in 49 CFR 24.404 and in section 6607 of our policies and procedures manual. So let's look at the learning outcomes for this module and let's see how they are connected to these issues we've previous, previously discussed. So at the end of this module you will be able to explain last resort housing LRH um, you'll be able to state at least three methods of providing last resort housing, although we're going to talk about a lot more than three. You will be able to determine the eligibility of persons who are failing to meet the occupancy requirements, remember the less than 90 days. Determine how to use last resort housing to resolve unique relocation situations. So as we've discussed, the agency must provide at least one comparable, decent, safe, and sanitary replacement dwelling before requiring anyone to move. So if the replacement housing payment exceeds the statutory limits, you must use last resort housing. So when last resort housing must be used, the agency is providing additional or alternative assistance to the displaced person. So what do you think constitutes the terms additional or alternative assistance? So it could be the higher monetary monetary payments or it could be alternative assistance in other ways which we're going to discuss shortly. So the agency must justify the need for this additional or alternative assistance. The agent must write up their justification on why they were not able to locate the comparable housing within the normal limits. Last resort housing must be approved by the reviewer 
and the district real estate administrator or in some situations by central office section manager. And we will discuss those situations in just a little bit. Blanket statements are not detailed enough. If you are going to request to use the provisions of last resort housing, it requires a lot of documentation and support. So agencies need to consider last resort housing in the earliest of the planning stages. And again, remember we talked about the conceptual stage and the pre-acquisition stage. In addition to providing the necessary lead time, this gives the agency the information to resolve the problems by identifying resources in the community that could provide assistance for the elderly or the disabled um, displaced persons, therefore reducing the use of last resort housing. Remember in that conceptual study, you're going to address any potential situations that you think will go into last resort housing. And we're going to talk about what some of those situations would possibly be here in a few minutes. So last resort housing can be used on an individual parcel by parcel basis and is approved at the local level by the reviewer and the district real estate administrator. And that is discussed in section 6607A. Justification means consideration was given to the availability of replacement housing in the area, to the resources available to provide the comparable housing, and to the individual relocating circumstances and needs. So last resort housing can also be used on an entire project basis, and that is discussed in section 6607B. This must be approved in writing by central office relocation section manager. So justification for a project-wide approval um, you would have to show that there is little, if any, comparable housing within the entire project area. The project cannot be advanced without last resort housing, and that last resort housing is cost effective when compared with the other project costs, such as construction delays or inflation. So there are some market indicators that will alert you that the comparables may be difficult to find and that last resort housing may be necessary. And these are what you will look for if you are preparing that conceptual study, or you'll also look for them <clears throat> as a relocation agent when you are preparing your pre-acquisition survey. So you may have some unusually large homes that are being acquired. And this could either be because they have a large square footage, um, or it could be that the houses we're acquiring just have a lot of bedrooms. It could be you have a very large family, house, you know, a very big household. Um, and because you remember the uh, the rule of adequate living space, you know, you may have a family that requires five bedrooms. Low income, you know, fam low income families that are maybe currently paying a, a modest or low rent. Or you may have um, a disabled displacee, you know, uh, or, you know, someone in a wheelchair. You may have also special work requirements. You know, there are some jobs and positions that will require uh, the person to live within either maybe within a township, within the city limits, um, within a certain, um, you know, miles of their job, such as a township trustee, maybe a mayor, maybe a member of city council. Uh, so you need to you need to ask 
you need to ask about, you know, where are you know, where do they work and are there any restrictions on where they can live? You know, you need to, um, you know, you, if you have elderly, you know, you need you need to ask the questions, you know, do they need a uh, one floor living? You know, can they not go up and down steps? And you absolutely, one of the most important things is you need to find out how long they have occupied. You need to know if they are less than 90 days. If they have occupied less than 90 days, then you're going to have last resort housing. So then there's the market indicators. Uh, market indicators that will uh, reflect if they're, if your displacies are going to have a problem with replacement housing. So what are some of these market indicators? And this is what we're seeing in Ohio right now. You've got rapidly escalating real estate prices. Then you also have lack of available housing. And most of that is because you've got the competition with the buyers. Right now to go out and buy a house, not only have, have the prices um, escalated from what they were, but now you have bidding wars. You know, if that's what you're seeing in the market, you very well could end up with last resort housing. So let's talk about some of the methods of providing last resort housing. So an RHP or an RSP in excess of the statutory limits is the most common method of providing last resort housing. And you may need to know that. To, so remember that is the most common method is excess of the statutory limits. And do you remember what those are? For an RHP, it's 31,000. For an RSP, it's 72,000. Or I'm sorry, 7,200. Um, so at ODOT, Section 6607.03, and uh, we also require that a rent supplement, supplement payment over $12,000 is paid in quarterly installments until the payment falls below $12,000. So if you can, if for whatever reason your rent supplement payment is $20,000 until you that payment gets down to 12,000, you're actually paying that in quarterly installments. Once it gets down to 12,000, you know, then um, then if needed, you can pay, you know, you can you can pay the full lump sum. And these installments or even the full amount can be directly assigned to a landlord uh, in, you know, if there are situations where that's what it's going to take to get them get them into a rental um, because of 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 bad credit. Um, also, it could be if if the if the tenant just that's what they prefer and and so they don't have to worry about paying the rent. You can assign the full or part of it to the new landlord. So an example of the second bullet point point on this slide would be, um, and, and let me read the bullet point first, rehabilitate or add to a replacement dwelling. So if you have a family that needs a five bedroom house and none are available, you have searched the market, you've expanded your search and your project in your project area, there are no five bedroom houses. The agency could pay to have, add a bedroom to a replacement site. And again, that would, you know, it, again, you've got the big family. They need five bedrooms. They have five bedrooms now. So their RHP offer would equal the comparables price plus the additional cost for this bedroom. So there may be situ there may be situations, some that we never actually see in Ohio, but we've that we do see some of these situations in other states where 
because of lack of housing, you can actually construct a new dwelling. You know, it almost it, it almost happened on a project called Bell 7, which um, that was before my time, believe it or not. Um, and so I don't know a lot about that project, but from what I understand, it was a situation where there just was not available housing. And so that was a consideration of actually constructing new dwellings for the replacement sites. Now, if that were to happen, the displaced person is the one that contracts to build the replacement home, not the agency. So on the final bullet, if the displaced person's credit is so bad that they cannot qualify for a purchase or construction loan, the agency would have to be very cre creative to make sure they had funds to purchase or build a replacement dwelling. So what could we do? Well, this could include the agency paying for higher interest, interest charges um, if the displaced person has terrible credit. It could include the agency actually providing a mortgage to the displaced person, which could either be with interest or interest free. You know, I had a similar situation and the displacee was able to secure a land contract when a bank would not loan them money for a down payment to purchase and a landlord would not rent to them because they had such bad credit. So that could, you know, a land contract could possibly be another option. Okay, we are ready for our first knowledge check. First question is last resort housing approved on a project wide basis requires the approval of, is it the relocation reviewer? Is it the relocation reviewer and central office relocation section manager? Is it the relocation reviewer and the district REA? Is it, all th uh, is it the relocation reviewer, the district REA, and the district deputy director? Project wide. Oh, we're kind of, we're a little all over the board here. So on a project-wide basis, it requires central office approval. On a individual parcel basis, it requires a reviewer and the district REA. So question number two. A blanket statement is utilized for approval request for last resort housing. Is that true or false? Okay, that is definitely false because not only can you not have a blanket statement, you're also going to provide a lot of documentation and support. Okay, question number three. A market indicator that may result in a need for last resort housing is... Is it rapidly es escalating real estate prices? Is it lack of available housing? Is it competition of buyers? Or is it all of the above? I 
That's correct. You all got it right. It is all of the above. Okay, let's go on to question number four. Other indicators that you may need to utilize last resort housing include, is it unusually large homes being acquired? Is it displaced persons with handicaps? Is it displaced persons who are elderly? Or is it D, all of the above? And you all got it right, great. It is D, all of the above. Those are all things that we talked about. Okay, so now um, there are some other methods of providing, providing last resort housing. Again, they're not usually seen at ODOT, but I need to teach you about them. Because sometimes you need to look outside the box and try to get a little creative as long as you stay within all the rules and regulations. So if there are no comparables on the market, the agency could work with the displaced person to actually move and re rehabilitate their existing home. Another last resort housing option would be for the agency to purchase a replacement home and re rehabilitate that home to meet the displacee's needs. Yet another option would be for the agency to purchase land and move other homes it purchased on the project to the land and re rehabilitate them for displaced persons use. Now, this could be either a sale or lease of a property, you know, uh, such as, you know, they have really bad credit. And this may be their only option of being able to get into another home. So remember, we said in module three that the replacement dwelling must be barrier free for disabled relocatees to be considered, <clears throat> considered DS and S. So you can remove barriers by, you can install ramps, you can widen doorways, um, all this under the provisions of last resort housing. Some other things you may need to do are add railings. You know, it could be they need um, grab bars in the bathroom and maybe they need, they need uh, uh, an electric chair on the stairway. You know, the agency can also look to trade-offs when there aren't suitable replacement dwellings available. And this is talked about in section 6607.03b. You know, what would some of these be? It could be, um, you know, they're upgraded to, um, but it's a smaller replacement home, but it's DSNS and it's adequate to accommodate the people displaced from marginal or substandard housing with probable functional obsolescence. Now this is, again, this is an exception. This is in last resort housing. It's uh, when you're, when you are looking for comparables under a normal situation, you want to, you, you want to look for those 15 points of comparability. So this is an exception. This is looking outside the box under last resort housing. You know, I, I, an example of how this would work, you know, perhaps um, only a, a portion of the, the uh, acquired dwelling was even used for living space, you know, such as the upstairs of a large two-story home was closed off due to poor and unsafe conditions. The Your displacee is, uh, an elderly, an elderly woman who hasn't gone up and down those stairs in years. And she, uh, so she has her bed, bedroom and everything on the first floor. You know, she says, I don't need, I don't need that. I don't need that second floor. And you know, it's, it's right now it's, it's non DSNS is not even usable. The stairs aren't safe. That would be a situation where 
you know, the house is non DSNS, you're going to put her in something um, suitable um, and that is DSNS. Again, under last resort housing, a lot of documentation to support that. The agency may use new manufactured housing to replace a very substandard conventional dwelling when comparable conventional dwellings are not available. So what does that mean, conventional? You know, you've got, you know, another way you say they're, they're stick houses, they're conventional, you know, versus manufactured or, or mobile homes. So obviously any last resort housing solutions such as these will need to be carefully thought out and crafted into a written contract before the agency begins to move, rehabilitate, or purchase any replacement housing. So although the last resort housing gives great flexibility to the agency, care must be exercised that any funds spent are done in a cost-effective manner using sound business practices, and the agency must ensure that the funds are used for the intended purpose to provide the decent, safe, and sanitary comparable replacement housing. So last resort allows for modified methods of providing replacement housing, but we can never lower the housing standards or lower the quality of living for that displaced person in that replacement house. Less than 90 day occupants. You know, in the previous modules, we discussed the eligibility of less than 90 day occupants or the, for the replacement housing payments. So what is a less than 90 day occupant? A displaced person is usually a tenant who has occupied the displacement dwelling less than 90 days prior to the initiation of negotiations or a person who moves into a dwelling after the initiation of negotiations, but before the agency actually acquires the property. They have not met the, that they have occupied that home for at least 90 days. They are less than 90 day occupants. So displaced persons who fail to meet the length of occupancy requirements as a 90 day occupant they are provided the exact same benefits, but they are paid under the provision of last resort housing. So they're still going to get their, their the, the housing payment, but it's under last resort housing. That's how we're able to do that because they haven't met the occupancy requirements. So let's take a look at some difficult relocations on the Cleveland Interbelt project. So using the provisions of last resort housing and good business practices, we will discuss one or two likely scenarios to resolve each of these situations. So the first situation is the Seasley family is a long-term owner occupant, but the family has had some difficult times. A year ago, Mr. Seasley lost his job and the family credit is in bad shape. They cannot qualify for a con conventional mortgage, but they re will require a mortgage to purchase housing and you need them to move. So what do we, what do, we do? So here's, here's a suggested answer, a couple of, of possibilities. So the agency may assist the, C, the Seasley family in a, obtaining private financing, which may require a higher interest rate than the prevailing market rate. So some agencies may hesitate to pay higher than prevailing rates, however, this could prevent the CZ family from being able to obtain co comparable replacement housing. So under the provisions of last resort housing, the agency 
can pay the higher increased interest payment. Remember, we have a payment, increased interest payment. Although these displaced persons may have poor credit, they did still have their house and it is the agency's actions that are causing them to lose their favorable interest rate and obtain a replacement mortgage. Now the agency may also pay a mortgage broker's fee to assist the CZ family with obtaining a replacement mortgage if it determines the fee is a reasonable and necessary expense. You know, working with a professional mortgage broker could be a way of of finding a you know a bank that will actually give them a mortgage despite their bad credit so that would be you know if we need them to move that would be last resort housing paying that extra fee so if the Seasley family cannot obtain financing the agency may also make a direct loan to them the loan may have regular monthly payments or a deferred repayment. It may bear interest or it may be interest free, depending on the individual circumstances. Also, if the owners choose to become tenants, then the agency may compute a rental assistance payment in accordance with section 6603. Remember, we kind of talked about that in some of the previous modules. You know, if they if they chose to do that, then you're establishing market rent, and you're and and then you're you're comping them to a a rental. Poor references. The Philibon family has been in a dispute with their landlord for the last several months. The landlord has stated that if it were not for the proposed project, he would have evicted them. He refuses to provide them a reference, and that has led to the denial of the rental application from other landlords. You have not found a landlord that will rent to this family. And I have had this situation. So what is a suggested answer? Well, one solution may be that the Philibon family uh, could reach an agreement with the landlord at the at the replacement site to pay a specific amount of the rental assistance in a lump sum payment directly to the landlord. Remember, we talked about this. You can assign all or part of that payment directly to the landlord if it's going to help them get in that house. Perhaps the first 12 months could be paid in advance as an incentive for the landlord to lease to these tenants. In this case, the tenant should enter into a 12 month lease agreement to cover the period of the rental assistance. The tenant would have to agree to the direct payment to the landlord. However, this may be the only method available to providing comparable DSNS replacement housing. An agency may also work with the Philibon family to see if they can convert their rental payment to a down payment assistance payment and purchase a replacement dwelling. You know, if they're unable, if they're unable to get approved for a, um, a, a mortgage, even though they have a down payment, you know, another option could possibly be a land contract. So the Link family is receiving a housing choice voucher and will be displaced on the Interbelt project. You have worked with the local public housing authority, but still cannot locate a comparable replacement dwelling that they can occupy using the housing choice voucher. You need to move this family in the next few months. You know, the problem with the housing choice voucher is often there's a long waiting list. So 
if you have a situation where someone has a housing choice voucher, you usually have this problem. So what is the suggested answer? If the agency cannot delay the vacate date for the dwelling until the displaced person can occupy a replacement dwelling using their housing choice voucher, it will have to compute a rental assistance payment under the provisions of the Uniform Act. This payment would be based on a private market dwelling unit rather than a similar dwelling unit under government housing assistance program requirements. Since the displaced person is likely to be classified as low income, the payment will probably exceed 50, the, um, the 7,200 and it will be in last resort housing. So the Link family will also be removed from the housing choice voucher program, which may not be in the Link's best interest since it is not lim since it's not limited to 42 months um, with, with the housing voucher program. And once they're out of that housing voucher program, it's very, very difficult to get back in. So if when you have a tenant who is either requesting to leave that program, yeah, it's something that you really want to discuss with them because they will have a very difficult time getting back in that program. This, the, yeah, anytime you have a situation where even if you need to comp them outside of a government program housing, you must fully explain to the links the, that they, so they are they understand the ramifications of moving into non-government assisted housing. They're obviously in it for a reason. They leave it, they may not get back in for a very long time. So other possible solutions, the agency can actually try to rec recruit landlords for the housing choice voucher program by educating them about the benefits of the program. The agency may also offer some type of incentive to them. For example, due to a prior landlord's poor reference, a landlord may be concerned about potential damages the tenants may cause to their property. The agency may be able to craft an agreement to provide for a limited reimbursement of such damage under the provisions of last resort housing. Any such agreement between the agency and the landlord should be discussed in advance with the, the local housing authority and their approval should be gained before entering into any such agreement. This arrangement could be more cost effective since the agency would not be paying a replacement housing payment and the displaced person would be remaining in government assisted housing program. So the agency may also work with the local housing authority to see if there is any public housing units available for a temporary period until a comparable replacement dwelling is available that the links could then use their housing voucher on. Al alternatively, it may co be cost effective to move the links into temporary private housing, short term rental or a monthly residence hotel until the housing authority property becomes available. And I, I have had a project where I did seek out landlords who would apply and become a, a government, uh, um, of, um, they would become available to receive the government housing vouchers and and was successful. Once they understand the program, where it requires an inspection, uh, but that is a really good alternative to getting someone who is currently in a housing voucher program to finding them a replacement site if the housing authority has none available. My experience has been they usually don't. So in any event, the alternative housing proposal um, if if there is uh, any any type of agreements with the um, 
uh, to put them in, you know, either private housing or um, all of that needs to be approved by the district real estate administrator. And it also needs to be approved by the central office section manager at ODOT. Are there, are there any questions about either of those situations before we, before we go on to the next one? Okay, so the next situation is the Stewart family currently owns and resides in a three bedroom home. However, there are too many people for the size of the dwelling according to the local housing codes. The family consists of Mr. and Mrs. Stewart, the four children, two boys, two girls, and Mrs. Stewart's elderly aunt. You have located only three bedroom homes in the area and the Stewarts need to stay in the area since they walk to school and to work and they have no other transportation. So here's a suggested solution. So the agency may add a fourth bedroom to a comparable three bedroom dwelling. Remember we, we talked about that being one of the options. The agency would add the estimated cost of constructing the additional fourth bedroom to the cost of a comparable replacement dwelling to compute the total cost of the comparable and the maximum price dif differential payment. So the students would, that the stewards would be responsible for purchasing a replacement dwelling and they would be responsible for contracting for the addition to add another bedroom. Now the agency may also offer a newly constructed four bedroom house as the comparable replacement dwelling. The estimated cost of construction, including the dwelling site, will establish the maximum price differential payment. If the stewards choose to build a replacement dwelling, they would contract directly with the builder for the construction of the replacement dwelling. The agency may also find an existing dwelling that has a family room or a den or other extra room that could be modified into a fourth bedroom. If the extra room is in the basement, most local codes would require that the basement have direct egress to the outside. So you have computed a rental subsidy for Mark Manzo, and he has found a very nice apartment with, within those computed amounts. However, he reminds you that he still needs the assist bars in the bathroom. The landlord has agreed to install these, but he also wants to be paid for the installation and the future removal of these items if Mr. Manzo should move from the dwelling. He is worried that the next tenant would consider the items a detriment to the property. So, here's the suggested answer. The agency can directly pay for the cost of the installation of the assist bars in the bathroom under last resort housing since Mr. Manzo requires this modification to make the replacement dwelling barrier free. The agency should obtain an estimate of the cost of installing and then at some point later removing the bars and paying this amount to the landlord in advance. In this situation, a lease addendum should be prepared that shows that the landlord was previously paid for this work. Now the, the agency should assist Mr. Manzo and the landlord in drafting a suitable agreement for the joint execution. The agency's legal counsel should be involved in drafting that agreement. Are there any questions concerning the last two scenarios that we talked about and the solutions before we go over our learning outcomes?
Okay, I will go over the learning outcomes. So how would you describe the last resort housing? Well, last resort housing is used when comparable replacement dwellings are not available within the monetary limits for the replacement housing payments. So what methods did we discuss for providing last resort housing? Replacement housing payments in excess of statutory limits. And remember, that is the most common use of last resort housing. And what were the statutory limits? For an RHP, it was 31,000. For an RSP, it was 7,200. Other methods to provide last resort housing, rehabilitate or add to the replacement dwelling. Remember the fourth bedroom. Construct new, a new dwelling. Again, the, the displacee is the one that contracts for the new dwelling, not ODOT. Provide a direct loan, which could be with interest or interest-free. Pay higher than market increased interest rates. Move and rehabilitate an existing dwelling. Purchase land and or a dwelling and then lease or sell it to the relocating. Remove barriers for handicapped and disabled persons. And removing barriers is the second most used the, the second most used reason for last resort housing at ODOT. So how are displaced persons eligible for replacement housing? If they fail to meet the length of occupancy requirements, they're eligible under the provisions of last resort housing. So we discussed the different difficult relocations and we came up with some unique solutions to resolve the displaced persons issues through last resort housing. You know, when it comes to some of the situations you're going to find out there, you need to try to be creative. Um, you know, the manual tries to address and give you guidance on uh, the situations that we, you know, unfortunately uh, commonly see. Um, but there's, you know, as a relocation agent, you're always going to be coming up with, you know, you're going to find new situations. And that's when you need to, you know, talk with your reviewer, talk with your district, talk with central office, and, you know, see if we can come up with solutions like we did in, in, in these scenarios we talked about that stay within the rules and the regulations, um, are cost effective for the project, and help us, help us meet and stay on time with clearing our project. So are there any other questions that anybody has concerning this module on last resort housing? If you have any questions, you can put them in the question box. Um, again, you can always follow up and send me an email. You can give me a phone call. Um, if there are no questions, then you can, uh, you can move on to your quiz. I am going to ask that you try to get this quiz done. I'd like it done by by um, the end of today. You know, uh, some of the quizzes aren't getting done until, you know, kind of last minute, and it makes it difficult to determine, you know, who can who can move on to the next module. Next module is module seven. That will be our last module um, prior to the t uh, the the test. And um, in the last module, I will uh, give you inst uh, the instructions of how we're going to handle. Um, taking the test for Relocation 101. So if there's no other questions, um, we are done with Module 6.